Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Julie Watson and I am joined here with Jessica Brooks and we are some wildlife education coordinators for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, we are going to be doing a super fun program. We're both really excited to talk to you all about raptors. Um, I'm going to be starting us off for the first half of this and then Jess is going to wrap it up and we are ending with owls so that's your um, motivation to stick around until the very end. We save the best for last and everyone's fan favorites so make sure that you do not leave before you learn about owls. So thank you Jess. Um, we will see you later. Uh, but we wanted to welcome you to this webinar before we dive in. If you've come to our webinars, you probably understand how a lot of this works, but we want to make sure just in case you're new because we want everyone to know what's happening. Um, but uh, we wanted to cover some housekeeping. So you're all muted. We cannot see you, we cannot hear you. You can communicate with us though in two ways. And I can see a lot of people are already testing it out. Um, you can use the chat box. We love chat conversation. It's a good way to um, have little side conversations that are uh, regarding something that's happening within the webinar and get some good conversations between participants. One thing about the chat box, just make sure that you have your, uh, it says two and then there's a little arrow that it says to all panelists and attendees, because otherwise only Jess, me, and we also have a volunteer, I almost forgot. Um, in our Q&A box, we're gonna have Sonia, she's one of our volunteers, um, and we can't see your chats if you don't change it to all panelists and attendees, or other people can't see them, only we can see it. Uh, so in the Q&As, that is open to ask tons of questions. Sonia will be in there answering questions all night long um, and should be really helpful. So without further ado, let's get started. So tonight we're talking about raptors. These are, uh, these are some of the main topics that we're going to be covering with raptors. We'll start by defining what a raptor is and some of those, um, some of those basic IDs, what to look for, how do we ID it, some of those key features. And then we are going to be spotlighting most of the time. The bulk of this program is going to be highlighting some of these key raptor species that you may come across in Nevada. And I did see in the chat that we have some people from out of state. And the cool thing about raptors is a lot of the raptors we're talking about tonight, you could probably find in your neck of the woods as well. So what is a raptor? Spoiler alert, we are not talking about Jurassic Park, ver Jurassic Park version of raptors, although birds are dinosaurs. So I guess we are kind of talking about dinosaurs tonight. Um, but let me know in the chat if you know what a raptor is. I know I saw before we started that a lot of you know what um, what a raptor is. So let me know if you know what a raptor is. Awesome, awesome, okay. So, great start. A lot of you are experienced with rap what raptors are. It sounds like a lot of you are raptor fans. These are birds that you enjoy, that you like to seek out. Um, but let's define some of these characteristics. So raptors are also known as birds of prey. And that is because they are carnivorous birds that hunt live animals for prey. And we know that many raptors will also eat dead prey, like eagles and hawks will eat carrion and dead things. Uh, typically, they have these features. They have um, a very curved beak, large talons. They have really powerful flight, and most of them have really good eyesight. And so raptors include owls, eagles, hawks, falcons, osprey, and then I put vultures in here, vultures with an asterisk because they don't fit into some of those categories that we just mentioned. And I've seen arguments for or against including them in the raptor category. They don't have the large talons. They do have hooked beaks, but they're, they're not quite the same shape as other raptors. 
Um, but they, and they almost exclusively eat dead prey, not live prey, but we're going to include them with an asterisk. And you can decide for yourselves if you want to include them in the raptor category or not, but we are including them in tonight's program. So here's a visual. This is obviously a bird we're all pretty familiar with. This is the bald eagle. And you, this is a great picture to point out some of those classic raptor um, characteristics, that big curved beak there. You can see it's like a it's like a knife for them basically. Like they, they can use that big hooked beak to tear off pieces of meat when they're eating their prey. They have strong wings and a, uh, a raptor feature is that they usually have broader shoulders and are kind of more top heavy than a lot of other birds like songbirds and even vultures have this trait and they have very strong wings and um, strong flight as well. Birds have good eyesight and then lastly, they have those long, sharp talons. So these are some of those characteristics in person that you can physically see on our raptors. So tonight, we will be focusing on these 12 species and how to ID them. We will start with the hawks and falcons, and then Jess is going to come in and finish us up with the eagles, vulture, osprey, and of course, the owls. And we hope by the end of this program that you feel a little more confident in your raptor ID. If you have been joining us on Wednesday nights for our other um, bird programs, you would know that our birding programs, the ways that we ID birds is first and foremost size and shape, then color pattern, behaviors, and then locations. And with our raptors, it's all the same. So these are going to be some of the four things that we're going to be covering to help you ID these raptors. We're going to start off with some hawks. We'll cover what we call field marks for these four hawks. And I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to start off with the most challenging hawk IDs. So it's only going to get easier after these first, first couple of hawks. The first group of hawks we're going to talk about are in the genus Excipiter. And this is our Cooper's hawk and our sharp shinned hawks. These birds are very interesting because they are designed and adapted to hunt other birds. So they've got short wings, but they're also very broad. And those short and broad wings give them a really strong wing beat, but then they're also very maneuverable because if you're catching birds, you have to be able to fly pretty with, with a lot of agility. And these are a really common sight in your backyard, especially if you have bird feeders because you are luring their prey into your yard. They also have these long skinny tails that also helps with the maneuverability. And um, they use all of that to help them catch their prey, which is primarily other birds. So these are the two hawks in the Exhibitor genus that we are going to talk about. And you can probably tell already that these two hawks look a lot alike. And in the birding world, IDing Cooper's hawks and sharp shinned hawks are some of the most difficult IDs because you're probably never going to see them right next to each other. And we are going to get started looking at the Cooper's hawk. So we're looking at size and shape. You can see it's got a longer tail. It's got that classic raptor beak and then um, some of that coloration as well. But they are 14 to 18 inches in height, two to three foot wingspan. Um, they're a, like a medium sized raptor. And this is where we're going to get into some of those identifying field marks. So the key between raptors and sharp shinned hawks is their tails. So, and it's, it's not that clear either, but the Cooper's hawk has a more rounded tail when it's in flight and when it's perching, you can barely see these tails here. Now this one, you can see this hawk is pulling its tail in. So it is in uh, its more soaring motion. So it doesn't have its tail fanned out, but you can see um, 
what it looks like there as well. And they also have a, you can see it really well in this picture right here, they have a really thin white band at the very tip of its tail. And it is a very bright white. Adults have a really red eye, which I think is something really cool. They look kind of sinister um, with their red eyes. And then they have this characteristic kind of dark blue gray cap. And they uh, have this lighter area going around the nape of the neck. Now, before we see the sharp shinned, I think that the Cooper's Hawk has a more, um, their heads are, their neck is more robust. I, they just seem to have like a thicker neck to me. This is a, 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 a very subtle way to ID, but they seem to have a thicker neck. And then when they're in flight, which we have two really good pictures of them in flight, their wings are a little more straight at the top. And you'll see um, how they look different in the sharp shinned, sharp -shinned um, picture in just a minute. So the sharp shinned hawk is a little bit smaller, although a large female sharp shinned hawk is going to be very similar in size to a small male Cooper's hawk. That's a cool thing about raptors is the females are typically larger than the males. Um, so they're a little bit smaller, but if you look at some of these markings, it's almost identical. So a small male Cooper's hawk and a female uh, large sharp shinned hawk could look very, very similar. So let's look at some of those differences. Size is a good indicator, obviously, um, but pretty difficult if you're seeing them separately. Obviously, it would be awesome if they just hung out together so you could see which one's bigger and be able to tell them apart. Um, but here are a couple differences. The sharp shin hawk has a more square tail when it's perching. And you can kind of see how the feathers lay over. And I will say this is difficult. This is a difficult bird ID. Um, even looking at some of these pictures, I deleted some of them because I'm pretty sure I had the wrong bird in the wrong area. Uh, but that tail is a good indicator. And if you look, their, their tail does have lighter on the tip, but it is not a distinct white band like we have, which like we saw with the Cooper's Hawk. Um, so that square tail is a good indicator. And sometimes there's even a little notch in that tail because of how the feathers lay. They also have a smaller head in my mind, uh, in, in my eyes, you can kind of see uh, comparing with that Cooper's Hawk that the head is just a little, the neck just isn't as robust. It's a little more dainty, I guess. Um, and then when the sharp shinned Hawk is flying, you can see it has its shoulders up a little bit more. So those shoulders are up. And a sharp shinned Hawk typically doesn't have a, the nape, that light nape area doesn't usually go back as far on a sharp shinned Hawk which I recognize a lot of this is very, very subtle. Um, but uh, I'm gonna quiz you on this later. So hopefully you're paying attention. This is a size comparison. This is our well-known red-tailed hawk, which we're gonna get to in just a minute. And comparing it in size with that sharp shin hawk, you can see how much smaller it is. So a sharp shin hawk is really quite a bit smaller. It's, it's a pretty small bird. All right. So it is quiz time. I'm going to launch a poll and I want you to tell me which side of this dotted line do you think the Cooper's Hawks are on? Is it the left side or the right side? All right, we've got some answers coming in. I know this is a tough one and I can already tell you guys are doing really good. So some of our indicators we had were on the head, the tail, the nape of the neck, the size, which you can kind of tell in these pictures. They're not 100% to size, um, but you can kind of tell. All right, we got lots of votes and great job. 
everyone almost uh, more people voted for right, which is the correct answer. You got it right if you voted right. That was our Cooper's Hawk. And some of those things that we mentioned, that white at the very tip of the tail, and you can see it's a more curved tail. And that kind of beefier head and neck area, which is very subtle in these pictures, and then size, they're a little bit bigger. In these ones, you can see that it has a more uh, squared off tail. The light on the bottom of the tail is a little more subtle. It's not as bright. That band isn't as big. And then the heads are a little bit smaller, but still you can probably see how difficult it is to differentiate between these two. All right, so we're gonna pull again and uh, I'm gonna pull up another poll and you're going to tell me which one is in flight, which one is the sharp shinned hawk in flight? Is it the one on the left or the one on the right? And remember, we talked about the shoulders. So our clue here is the size and then the shoulders, if you can remember what, uh, what, what, we, what the indicator was for that. All right, you all voted so fast, very confident. Uh, I'm gonna end, end this and share the results. Almost everyone said left, which is awesome. That is correct, good job. And you could tell we have the more um, squared off tail with the little notch in there and then the elbows. You can see really well in this picture, the elbows are sticking up on that sharp shin, the Sharpie, and the Cooper's Hawk is a little more straight at the top of its wings and the size. You can see the, the sharp tailed is a little, or the sharp shin is a little more, uh, is, a, is a little small. So behavior, that is one thing that helps us identify birds. If you see the, if you see a bird near your bird feeder eating birds, you probably got an exhibitor somewhere in your yard or in your neighborhood. I know that I see a Cooper's Hawk in my neighborhood all the time. It's super fun. Um, but that is one of their main behaviors is they are a very, they, both of these species are incredibly urban. They like to go, uh, they like to hang around your bird feeders in your backyard or in areas where uh, there's a lot of other songbirds. So that's a big thing for their behavior with the exhibitors. So moving on, we're going to go to our second genus in the hawks in the group of the hawks. We're gonna move from the exhibitors and go to the bootios. These are larger hawks. They are soaring hawks. They have longer wings than the exhibitors, but they are still very broad and they have much shorter tails and they fan out a lot more. They don't have that, that straight tail like the exhibitors do. And here's a comparison. You can see a difference in even the size and then where those wings are. So these are a, a much differently shaped bird. And the two species that we are going to highlight in our Budio genus is the red-shouldered hawk and the red-tailed hawk. And as I told you, it's only going to get easier. You can see already that these two hawks do not look that much alike. And we're going to start with the red shouldered hawk. They are bigger than both our Cooper's hawk and um, and the sharp shinned hawk. They are a large hawk with a really nice big wingspan. And looking at this picture, you can start to get a glimpse into how colorful these birds are. I think that red shouldered hawks are really beautiful and they really are a, a, a pretty colorful bird. Some of their markings that we can use to identify them is they have a very prominently 
banded tail and you can see it really well when they're flying when they're juveniles which we are only looking at adults right now because um this is beginner even though i started with a really hard bird id um when they are juveniles they still have the bands but they aren't quite as pronounced but it is still banded they have a lot of modeling in their wings which i think makes them look really interesting when i see a red-shouldered hawk they these markings on the ends of the wings when they're perched is the first clue to me that this is not a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks might have modeling, but it's not going to be quite as pronounced or as dramatic as in the red-shouldered hawk. And then, of course, how they get their name is these rust-colored stripes on their chest and their shoulders. And then when they fly, they do not have what I like to call, I don't know what the, the correct term is, but I call them shoulder pads. Um, they do not have shoulder pads. So you can see right here, this is not dark. It's a lighter color. It might be rust colored, um, but this is a big indicator for a red tailed hawk. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So the red tailed hawk is a larger bird than our red shouldered hawk. They have, they're a little bit taller, their wingspan is a little bit bigger, um, and they are obviously, this is not quite as tough of an ID as our sharp shinned and Cooper's hawk, um, but you can see some of those coloration differences already between our uh, red shouldered hawk and our red tailed hawk. So the red tailed hawk, obviously, it just like our red shouldered hawk, it has a red tail that gives it its name. And uh, again, we are not doing juveniles. The juveniles do not have the red tail. But when you can see this rusty red colored tail, very easy to properly ID the red tailed hawk. But as you can see in some of these pictures, when they're flying, sometimes you can't see that red tail. Some other things to look for in the red-tailed hawk, because red-tailed hawks come in a lot of different colors, which can make a bird who I think is pretty easy to ID, sometimes kind of difficult. And even in these pictures, you can see some of that variation in coloration. And a, a good indicator that you are looking at a red-tailed hawk, if you can't see the tail, is the belly band. And even in some of these pictures, it's really subtle. Like this is a very light colored bird. It still has that line of dark feathers across its belly. You can see it very well pronounced right here. And um, you can see it on this one as well. This one at the bottom is really light, um, but it still has it. So that belly band is a good thing to look for. They do typically have a lighter breast with a brownish head, but there are some that are super, super white, super light, and there are some that are all dark. Um, and then lastly are those shoulder pads. So if you remember on the red shouldered hawk, we they had just very, very, they didn't have these, these dark feathers at the top of its wings right here. And you'll see that even in all of these different color morphs, it's still present. So that's a really uh, easy way to tell when they're flying that you are looking at a red-tailed hawk. All right, we're doing it again. We're gonna quiz again. So if you could tell me which one is the red-tailed hawk. So is it the left side or the right side? And remember, we're looking at the tail, we're looking at those shoulder pads, we're looking at the coloration on the chest, on the belly. Those are some of our field marks that we're looking for. All right, awesome, awesome. Most people got it right. Our red-tailed hawk is on the right side of your screen. Great job. You guys are on your way to becoming raptor experts. Now our Budio behavior, they are a much more generalist than the Accipiters, but they are big 
mammal eaters. So they will go after birds like the exhibitors and eat carrion and dead stuff as well. But mammals are really their jam. That's their favorite food. So wherever there are small mammals, you'll probably see some red-tailed hawks hanging out. Moving on, we're going to get into the falcons and comparing these with our buteos and our exhibitors. These are a totally different shaped bird. They are sleek. They have narrow wings, pointed wings. They're long compared to their body. And then they've got that long straight tail. They are designed for speed and agility in flight. Here is a comparison of all the three uh, groups that we've talked about so far. Our exhibitors, our falcons and then our beautio. So you can see those different shapes. Seeing the pointed wing and those shoulders, I call them shoulders, being up and kind of more pointed is a really good indicator that you are looking at a bird that is in, that is a falcon. So we're going to talk about two different species of falcon, the American kestrel and the peregrine falcon. Obviously not really a challenge in IDing these two, but they are still pretty amazing birds. The American kestrel is a small little bird. At first glance, I know I've done this several times, I've confused them with morning doves. They are a very similar size to a morning dove and morning doves have a longer pointier tail and they are seen perching in the same spots. I've seen morning doves on one side of a power line and a kestrel sitting on the other. So that's where that behavior comes in. They do kind of do the same things as well. Um, but the kestrel obviously has a much more, uh, a much more bulkier head than the morning dove does. Uh, kestrels and falcons do not look alike. So this is pretty easy ID. Kestrels are beautiful. They are so colorful. Um, this is a male right here. Males typically have more of this blue and slaty color where females are going to be a little more um, that rusty color, but they are so colorful. Um, and they're, again, they are really small. I think they are surprisingly small for a raptor. And I get asked a lot what my favorite bird is. And the kestrel is always really high up there because they're so tiny. They're a small raptor, but they are so feisty. Um, they are amazing predators for how small they are, which I think is pretty cool. And a very distinguishing characteristic of our falcons is these lines on their face, their, their sideburns, their mustache, whatever you want to call it. That is a very characteristic part uh, or a very uh, characteristic feature in falcons. If you see a bird that's got these sideburns going on, probably a falcon. The peregrine falcon is a lot bigger than the kestrels. This is, is a more medium sized raptor and you can see it does not look like a kestrel. Probably not going to get these two confused. Uh, the peregrine falcon is again has those classic uh, sideburns on their face. They have a slate gray on the back um, and pretty patterned on the underside and they are they are a medium-sized bird. Pretty cool looking especially if you can see them uh, diving. And I'm not going to do a quiz because these are very easily identified, but I am going to play a video. So this is our peregrine falcon up here, and I'm sure most of you are aware that peregrine falcons are incredibly fast. In a dive, they've been recorded going over 200 miles per hour. Um, they are a super speedy diver, and they also, like our exhibitors, are bird specialists. They are very, very good at going after other birds. They're also an urban bird, so this is a bird that you could see in an urban environment very easily, and that's because they nest on cliffs, and one thing that is very similar to cliffs are uh, skyscrapers, which is kind of crazy. This video that I'm gonna show you though is actually of a kestrel and kestrels are, obviously I already shared that I have a bias towards them. They're one of my favorite birds, uh, but kestrels 
they do this thing called kiting and it kind of looks like hovering. And so I'm gonna show you this video. Hopefully it will play. Of this kestrel kiting. You can see how fast its wings are beating. But they will do that behavior while they're hunting. Um, and that is the end of the falcons. And I am going to bring up uh, Jess here, she is going to get us started with the rest of the birds that you are going to learn about. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was unmuted. And very quickly before I start, thank you, Julie. Um, I was listening and learning and watching the polls. Everyone did a great job. Um, I was watching everyone vote and everyone did a great job. So thank you so much for participating in that stuff. Um, I've also been watching the chat and responding to a few things in there. So thank you so much for responding to questions that Julie has. Um, I don't have any polls, but um, what I do have are cool pictures. The very first thing I'm gonna be sharing with everyone is the golden eagle. So first, uh, let's talk about what eagle shape looks like. Uh, that is one of the first things that we look at when we are identifying some of our raptors. In terms of shape, they have long wings, very long wings. In fact, some wingspans are up to six feet, six and a half feet. Um, eagles in general will soar with their very long wings. Uh, slightly raised in a V shape, or um, also called a dihedral shape. In this eagle silhouette, they'll typically show a small-ish head compared to the rest of their body, and they'll also have a fanned tail down here, all fanned out. Uh, their broad wings will stretch across their entire body and will have this rounded tip with a little bit of these fringe, and these are all these feathers here. And these rounded wing tips are one of the telltale signs we know it's an eagle, apart from it being just a very huge bird. So golden eagles are very common here in the West, especially in Nevada. They are terrestrial birds. Um, they're 28 to 37 inches in height. So that's pretty tall. <laughs> Um, and six, 6.5, seven foot wingspan. I really wanted to show off this picture here of a biologist safely with help holding a golden eagle, eagle stretched out so we could see the wings and the wing tips. Um, they're doing that so they could tag the bird. But I also wanted to point out that even when landing, golden eagles do have this fanned out um, tail and they do show these fanned out fringe rounded wing edges and those are the feathers there. Um, golden eagles, I really wanted to show some of these close-ups too because they're so beautiful. In general though they're very large. Overall they have a dark brown body. Their, um, their tails are dark typically fanned out and they do have some of that barring that we see here and it looks sort of like a checkerboard pattern with some dusky grays and dark brown but since the feathers are layered on top of each other you get that barring structure. They also have dark eyes with a strong brow and typically I'll have people tell me oh they just look so angry but they're not, that's just how their bone structure is. They just have that heavy, heavy brow. Uh, they also have a yellow uh, hooked beak with a black tip. And of course they have yellow feet with black talons. I also wanted to show off some of the, um, the, the life cycle, some of the youngins that we may see only because it is possible if you're birding to see this stage of life 
uh, through your binoculars or while you're out and about. And, you know, we want you to be prepared. So let's go through them very quickly. Hatchlings are right here. They're very cute. They're little cotton balls, all white. Eaglets are here with downy feathers. Now they're not the same size as an adult eagle, but eaglets um, at this stage are also called juveniles. And they're starting to show some of those adult plumage colors come in. Um, eaglets um, between stages three and four are, you know, they're learning to eat larger pieces of flesh. They're maybe being pushed out of the nest or being pressured to leave the nest. They're learning to fly. They may have some of those um, little puffs of downy feathers come through, but they're getting to their adult plumage fully grown in and they're also getting to their, their um, adult size. Now here, when we get to fledglings, this is more often than not, I feel like what I see when I'm looking for eagles and when I see something, you know, I think that might be an eagle. The coloration though, you can really tell the difference. So a fledgling or uh, almost an adult who's learning to fly has left the nest, but they also have these white wing patches just underneath in the center. And then they also have these white patches at the base of their tail. Um, the rest of their plumage is almost grown in to show their adult coloration, but you may have some speckling in there. Um, and that speckling may be different for every bird. So some speckling might be a little bit more stripy. Some speckling may be a little bit more spotted. It just sort of depends. And then up here, of course, is a complete adult, same size as a fledgling, but the coloration of the plumage is very different. And we see that overall shape, right? That we talked about, the, the wingtips being fanned out, that fringe showing and the tail being fanned out. Um, one thing I would like to note too is in the adult stage on the back of their neck, a golden eagle will have a very vivid light golden color in their feathers. But when they're flying, we can't really see that color because it's on the back of their neck. Um, in terms of golden eagle behavior, uh, golden eagles primarily will prey on small to medium-sized mammals like hares, rabbits, brown squirrels, prairie dogs, even marmots. Um, Black-tailed jackrabbits in particular are one of their main sources for food. Um, but they are capable of taking down much larger prey like this. <laughs> this is a deer. Um, a doe. In fact, um, they can also take down animals like cranes, uh, swans, even domestic livestock, although it's not really common. Um, they've also been seen taking down coyotes, even bobcats, bighorn sheep, but what they really like to go after are smaller animals. And like I said, they are terrestrial. So you'll find these birds typically over uh, widespread areas, um, you know, hunting over, over the ground and they'll wildly flap as they run if they are on the ground, but while they're in the air, they'll, um, they'll hover a little bit and then slowly glide until they're ready to take down an animal. Um, single eagles and pairs of eagles will enjoy this aerial play of sorts while they'll pick up objects, swoop up really high in the sky, drop the object like a stick or a bone, um, and then swoop down to pick it up and then do it again. And I've actually seen this, it's very cool. And I couldn't find a video of it because um, some of the videos were, you know, they weren't, they, they wouldn't play well, but it is something to look into. It's very cool to see, but as a birder, you know, someone who goes out and looks at birds, um, someone who's just getting used to identifying some of these birds, especially golden eagles. If you see this sort of aerial play, that might be a key feature to tell yourself, oh, this is what I'm looking at, it's an eagle. 
Um, a couple more things to look for for golden eagle behavior. So nests can be pretty easy to spot if you're a birder, simply because they're so big. Um, but are, but uh, we have to really be looking for those nests. They're pretty well hidden. Um, golden eagles will construct these huge nests from large sticks, usually overlooking their hunting grounds. Uh, these eagles usually nests on, nest on cliffs, but they may also build nests high up in trees, even on the ground. It just sort of depends on their habitat and situation. Even human-made structures, including uh, windmills, observation towers, they've even been seen using nesting platforms, which is very cool. And uh, last but not least, I did want to point out that the coloration difference between a golden eagle and a turkey vulture, and as Julie mentioned earlier, we are going to talk about turkey vultures tonight with an asterisk attached to it. So I love turkey vultures. I think they're super fascinating uh, and they're so unique and so different. They're around the same size as the golden eagle. The shape is a tad different and I'll show you a little bit more of what that looks like. But as far as coloration goes, um, golden eagles do have this dark brown color around uh, the, the leading edge of their wings and then a lighter brown, a lighter golden around the, the fringe of their wings. In comparison to a turkey vulture, they'll typically have this dark gray or a black coloration along their leading edge. And along the fringe, they'll have a light gray or a tan color. Both birds have this fringe, this fanned out edge. Um, but of course the fanned tail may also be a dead giveaway that it's not a golden eagle. Oh, and of course the red featherless face. And <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a few moments. I can't forget that. So a turkey vulture with this asterisk attached to it. Uh, they're two and a half ish feet in height and they do have that six foot wingspan. Some may be larger, six and a half foot wingspan. They are dark in color, um, dark golden, gray, black, dark brown with some of these real vivid, um, almost iridescent browns. Sometimes that can be seen on a golden eagle, but this, um, this, <laughs> Featherless bright red head is a big telltale sign. And we'll talk about why they have this. Uh, but first, some of the key features that you'll look for in comparison to a golden eagle, uh, chicks up here, hatchlings, have all downy feathers. They're white and then they'll have this dark colored face and beak. Juveniles right here have gray heads some adult plumage coming in in the back here with some tufts coming through of that, uh, that downy, those downy feathers. Fledglings down here, I've actually seen, they're pretty common depending on the time of year. Um, they have some ashy gray colored naked heads and most of their adult plumage has come in with some fluff feathers around their chest and neck area. Um, immature, turkey vultures have that naked um, featherless red head with gray tipped beaks. Um, it's not fully red yet up here. Adults though have that full, full brown color and the full bright red featherless head. Um, in terms of feet, adults can have light tan, orange, pale feet. Um, brown and black plumage with gray flight feathers and gray tail feathers are the main thing that you want to be looking for when you do see a turkey vulture. Um, plumage is a big one. As far as that um, naked bright red head um, that you see in this second picture here, um, they have that featherless head because it helps them stay clean. Turkey vultures are actually incredibly clean birds. Um, in this second picture here, we see the turkey vulture preening or cleaning its feathers. 
Um, so yeah, in general, vultures are pretty clean. Having that featherless head allows them to be head first into an animal carcass, which is carrion, which is what these animals eat, um, or another animal carcass, and not having flesh stick to them, um, stick to those feathers. You know, if they did have feathers on their head, when they would pull their head out, they would have flesh and blood and all kinds of grossness stuck to them. So eliminating those feathers keeps them a little cleaner. Adults also have that white beak and dark eyes. And then again, those light tan and light orange feet come through. As far as turkey vulture behavior goes, um, they're pretty easy to spot. Turkey vultures soar with their wings raised high up in a V, a little bit above their body. And they make wobbly circles when they ride um, heat thermals in the sky. Uh, the most common time to see a turkey vulture is while driving. So look up along the sides of the highways and freeways and along the skies over open areas. And if you're hiking or traveling in hilly or mountainous areas, um, keep your eyes peeled for vultures high up in the sky. Um, if you do come along um, sudden changes in the topography, like a cliffside or a really strong hilly area that allows for those um, updrafts, those high heat thermals to roll through. And that's what these birds use to carry them along. They don't typically flap a whole bunch when they fly, but you may see them uh, swirling in the sky like this sometimes with other birds, and when it is with other birds, that's called a kettle, which is, to me, it's very cute. Um, and then depending on the time of year, you'll also see a bunch of vultures um, pick a really nice tree to perch on, like this one here. And um, that is just them roosting for the day. Um, sometimes dozens to 100 individuals can be seen just on one, just on one tree. Um, another, another cool thing to see is when vultures will stop, land on the ground, and then open up their wings. And that's them warming for the day or drying off if they, if they did just have a feast. Um, and like I said earlier, turkey vultures eat carrion, which they find largely by their excellent sense of smell. Um, mostly they eat animals, but sorry, mammals, mostly they eat mammals, but they have also been seen snacking on reptiles, even other birds, um, and amphibians, fish, um, even small critters like invertebrates. They really prefer freshly dead animals, which is why we typically will see them near roadsides for roadkill, but uh, they do have to let the animal sit a little bit so they can pierce through that skin because their beaks aren't exactly hooked like we've seen in the other raptors that we've talked about this evening. Um, they also rest in rock crevices, caves, uh, thickets, mammal burrows even, and hollow logs. Um, they don't really have nests. So I did talk about what to look for when keeping an eye out for golden eagle nests. Turkey vultures don't really build full nests. Instead, they just sort of like scrape out a spot in the soil or leaf litter, pull aside some twigs and sticks, arrange some rocks and some vegetation and call it good. Okay, so the, we did talk about the, um, the golden eagle versus the turkey vulture. They do have some similarities, but if you're really looking, you can tell a difference. So I don't have a poll for that. Um, we are going to talk about the osprey, which to me is one of the more fascinating birds. I've seen them in, I've seen them in motion. I've seen them in action. They're really, really cool. As far as their shape goes, they do have this M shape, um, narrow wings with these very pointed shoulders coming through. And they have long wing length, but there's really no fanning out like we saw in the turkey vulture and the golden eagle. They do have a long tail and pointed wing tips, 
but like I said, there's no flare out in these wings. Here's that M again that I was uh, talking about earlier. They are around two feet in height, maybe a little lower than that. Five to six foot wingspan, so just as broad as a golden eagle or a turkey vulture, maybe a little smaller. They have a white head with a thick dark brown stripe that you can see here that continues down the neck and onto the back. They have bright, piercing yellow eyes and a dark, sharply hooked beak. They have white breasts and belly and darker backsides. Um, they also have uh, noticeably dark crooks near their wrists and that's what these are right here. Kind of like wrist guards or wrist pads and darker wing tips. Um, behavior for ospreys are um, one of the easiest things to look for when you're out birding and looking for these guys. So the eggs and chicks are super well camouflaged. You really won't see those if you're out birding, but uh, in terms of nesting and spotting osprey nests, they really do require nest sites that are open in surroundings for uh, an easy approach with a wide sturdy base. That's what we see up here at number four. Um, and this allows them to stay safe from ground predators like raccoons. And nests are usually built on snags, which are old growth dead trees that are still standing. Uh, tree tops, crotches between big large branch, branches and tree trunks, even on cliffs and human built platforms. And that's what we see up here. So I wanted to point out some of the chicks. They're just so cute. I had to include them even though birders don't really see them that often, but you may see some of the little ones being perched up on the edges of the nests. Um, and then an immature right here does still stay camouflaged within the leaf litter, the twigs that are found in the nest, but some of that uh, adult plumage is starting to come in. Um, if they do nest on artificial platforms that we build specifically for ospreys, um, they will continue to build up that nest over time. And um, sometimes um, I, I have read that in two, in two different studies that nests built up over years and years, over generations can become uh, 10 to 13 feet deep and three to six feet in diameter, which is huge, simply huge, easily big enough for a human to sit in. A little bit more about their behavior, and this is really what we'll be looking for when we are when we are out in nature hiking, looking for these ospreys. Um, ospreys are the only hawk on the continent that eats exclusively live fish. About ninety nine percent of their diet consists of live fish. Um, on very rare occasions, they'll be seen eating other things like birds, snakes, voles, even salamanders, maybe but usually it's fish. They also get most of their water they need from the flesh of the fish. So it's not really common. You'll see them just hanging out drinking the water. Um, they really aren't able to dive deep though, but when they do dive, they dive head first, fast with their feet and talons facing forward and outstretched wide, which is what we see here. And here's another view of that same picture. You'll see that ospreys have their, their feet and talons out in front of them, uh, sort of protecting their face a little bit. But the goal of this is to dive into the water where they do see a fish, grab it as soon as possible, and then just get out of the water as, as quick as possible too. Um, when they do fly away with fish in tow, they'll turn the fish to face forward, which is very cool. <laughs> um, this eliminates drag and creates a streamlined shape for the osprey so it's easier to fly. They'll normally fly back to a safe perch 
or to their nest to eat in safety as well. So when we are out birding, looking for osprey, this is what you want to be looking for. We talked about the coloration. More often than not, you'll see them perched up on a tree branch or high up on a hill, um, overlooking a waterway. But like you're overlooking a waterway like rivers, uh, lagoons, swamps, marshes, um, wetlands, slow moving water, something like that. But this is what you'll be looking for, this behavior. So very quickly, here is a review. So Julie talked about excipiters and those included sharp shinned hawks, Cooper's hawks, Northern goshawk. We didn't really get to those, but you all did really well on the, on the polls, on the quizzes that she was giving you. We talked about uh, the American kestrel and the peregrine falcon and also um, red-tailed hawk. Everyone did great. We very briefly talked about the golden eagle and the turkey vulture. They're very similar and the osprey. So before we go this evening, we are going to talk about some of our nocturnal raptors or owls. So before we jump into these three most popular owls seen by birders, it's important to know that in general, owls are hard to spot. Um, we'll talk about why they're difficult to spot in a bit, but if you're looking, you really do have to look. And uh, we're gonna start with the great horned owl. So great horned owls are thick bodied. They have mottled gray, brown, reddish um, brown faces and a neat white patch on the throat. Um, the white patch can range in size and can sometimes barely even be seen, but um, most have it. They do have a distinct reddish cinnamon colored facial disc, which is here. And it's usually outlined by dark colored or black feathers. They also have sharp talons, of course, which is one of the one of the reasons why we consider them raptors. And their legs and their feet are covered with feathers. Their overall plumage color, though, um, ranges depending on the region from sooty gray to a pale gray tan like this one up here. And lastly, they have two feather tufts on either sides of their head, bright piercing yellow eyes and a dark rounded sharp hooked bill. Um, great, horned owl, great horned owls are of course nocturnal, meaning they're alert at night. They can be seen at dusk sitting on fence posts or in trees like this one right here, or flying across roads and fields, of course. Um, they can be incredibly difficult to spot since their plumage coloration and all their patterns allow them to camouflage super well in their environment. So as you can see in these two pictures, um, this owl, the backside blends in incredibly well with the tree and in this picture, even with wings spread open, their underwing coloration and their plumage still helps them blend in incredibly well. They have all different kinds of body feather types and they have different patterns. And we mentioned this earlier, but it may look sort of like stripes or a checkerboard pattern. But when you have all those feathers laying on top of each other, you have all these layers of camouflaged patterns working together. They also have, oh, sorry. They also have this leading edge of this primary, of these primary feathers, which is the leading edge of their wing. Um, has a special attachment to it or a special function, special form. And it's this comb-like structure that breaks up the wind when they fly. So not only are owls difficult to see because they camouflage so well, they're also difficult to hear because this structure on their wings helps damper that sound when they fly. So they're essentially silent when they fly, which means we can't hear them, but also prey can't hear them either. 
Um, in terms of behavior for great horned owls, very quickly, they're known to be seen just about everywhere. Woodlands, swamps, orchards, forests, fields, deserts, wetlands, even rent residential areas. And they have an extremely diverse diet, basically eating anything they can get their talons around. So rodents, even insects, birds, uh, gophers, cats, so watch your kitty cats, ravens, hawks, rabbits, fish, squirrels, ducks, you know, like I said, anything. Um, although they're nocturnal, they have been known to hunt in broad daylight. It's just not that common. And I wanted to show you the size and coloration difference between an adult great horned owl and an, an owlet, which is a baby owl. It's also known that um, especially great horned owls can nest and build nests just about anywhere. They can also take over nests from other birds. Um, they can be in trees, on the ground, in cliff sides, even in cacti. And uh, next is a burrowing owl. I love burrowing owls. They are so distinct looking, so unique, so cute. They're pretty small. They're seven to 10 inches in height, barely a foot. Um, and they only have about a two foot wingspan. And I really love this picture because you can see that checkerboard pattern, um, this barring that we talked about earlier, but all those feathers are laid on top of each other. So you, you get this um, molten uh, blending of camouflage patterns working together. Um, so unlike the great horned owl that we just mentioned, burrowing owls are diurnal, meaning they're alert during the day. Burrowing owls are small, round-headed, sandy-colored owls. Um, here's a great picture here of a small colony. Uh, they do live in the ground. They have very long legs, bright yellow eyes, um, white charismatic eyebrows, um, some have a light colored narrow patch just below their um, chin or where their chin would be, but not all have this. And you can kind of see that in some of these owls here. Uh, they mainly hunt close to the ground by hovering or flying low, um, even walking or running after prey. So if you're out birding and looking for these um, owls, you might want to look close to the ground, um, keep a lookout for where you might see a lot of beetles, caterpillars, scorpions. They're also known to eat lizards, snakes, turtles, uh, small birds, even small rodents. This burrowing owl right here is on, is working on eating a frog. So you can see the back end of a frog here. And uh, since burrowing owls live underground in burrows, they dig them themselves, which takes a while, or they can also take over burrows from other animals like ground squirrels, tortoises, even skunks or badgers. And um, like I said earlier, if you are looking for burrowing owls, you might look around near grasslands, open deserts, open plains, um, any wide expanses with short, low vegetation, even ditches and hilly culvert areas. Um, for, for birders especially, you may also see adults, which we've been looking at, but here I wanted to show you some, uh, some juveniles, um, some owlets, if you will. They do have uh, the same basic outline, the same basic silhouette as an adult, but you can see some of those uh, downy um, fluff feathers come through, but they are the same size. Um, during breeding season, they can be alert and awake 24 hours a day, but since they do live in um, colonies, some of the adults will take turns or take shifts keeping watch for that uh, small colony area, taking turns hunting as well. So a spotting scope may also be helpful when looking for burrowing owls. Since they're relatively small compared to the wide open areas they live, 
Uh, you may also need a lot of patience and time to scan for their likely habitat. So you might wanna pay close attention to dirt mounds, ditches. Um, oftentimes we might also see burrowing owls standing just outside their burrow, like this little one right here. But we might also just see the tops of their heads and their eyes poking out. And they have a tendency to stare directly at you. So they'll hold completely still, helping them to blend in just a little bit more. All right, last but not least, we're going to talk about my favorite, the barn owl. So barn owls are medium-sized, pale, lanky birds with a white-ish heart-shaped facial disc. And you can see that facial disc here, that heart shape come through. Their facial disc is usually in a wide heart shape. They have smooth rounded heads and very dark eyes. They also have whitish chests, a belly, and underwings that you can see here. Some of, sometimes you'll see some dusky color come through, but on their back sides, like in this picture here, um, you'll get that dusky buff brown gray molted pattern that we've seen in other owls that helps them blend into their environment. Um, their wings are very short and rounded, and they have very short tails. So wide at the base, wide all the way down to the tip, and wide short tails, which helps them have a very unique uh, flight pattern. Well, they're, they'll kind of bounce off um, each wing beat. So each time they flap their wings, they'll kind of bounce a little bit. They also have pale legs and uh, their legs are not covered in feathers. So barn owls are nocturnal, which means they're alert at nighttime, um, exclusively nocturnal actually. Um, they hunt and build their nests at night. So they nest in quiet, protected cavities, um, usually in abandoned buildings, especially barns, silos, even churches. Um, sometimes rock crevices, thick, dense trees, caves, burrows, <laughs> anywhere they feel protected and away from some elements. Um, females will make out a nest or partially a nest from their own regurgitation, which is fascinating. They'll shred them up with their feet, arrange them in a little bit of a bowl, and call it good. Uh, these quiet protected little cavities that they build their nest from are also used every single year, often by different owls. So it's sort of a first come first serve situation. Um, nesting areas are not really seen by birders, but we might see a barn owl entering or leaving a nesting site. Um, in the pictures that we're looking at, we see an owl in a nesting box, which barn owls in particular really love and uh, this owl is incubating its eggs and in this picture here we see a clutch of four owlets with some semi-developed facial disc that heart shape that we were talking about there and also covered in those white fluff feathers uh, fledglings and juveniles so almost adults develop their adult plumage slowly over time but may show small tufts of fluff feathers for several months. So barn owls eat mostly small rodents, mice, voles, uh, rats, shrews, sometimes bats, even though bats are not considered rodents, rabbits. Um, they hunt at dusk and at night by slowly flying over open fields with those slow and looping wing beats and buoyant flight patterns that we talked about. Their heart-shaped facial disc helps guide sound directly to their ears, which aids in their amazing hearing. They've, um, they've also had some um, noticeably different color variations in barn owls. So here we have that, the typical lighter color variation. And then we also have this beautiful dusky um, coloration come through. Um, and these 
different color variations can have an effect on hunting success for barn owls, but only on well-lit moonlit nights. Um, it is worth noting though, so when you do go out and see a barn owl, um, you might see a little bit of a, a browner, more dusky color. Um, so barn owls in general can be spotted roosting in hidden quiet places during the day, not necessarily their nest. At night though, they can be spotted hunting by flying and gliding over meadows, over, over open fields, even roadsides. Um, birders can also listen for their eerie, raspy shrieks. Um, many people's first sightings of barn owls is while driving. That was my first experience as well at night and seeing that quick flash of white just above the tops of vegetation or over a field, or in my case, over my headlights across the road. So I would say keep an eye out for that flash of light, that flash of bright white, which is their undersides, um, near barns, old abandoned buildings, over fields, even residential areas. Oh, and I also wanted to point out how um, if you remember, we mentioned how an osprey will dive headfirst with their talons pointed um, wide open and their legs stretched out. Barn owls hunt in a very similar way. So as soon as they clutch their prey, they'll grab it and then take off again. So very quickly, I wanted to mention some resources. I am watching the chat a little bit. So thank you very much for chatting with us, participating. Um, I'm gonna leave this slide up for just a few moments as well. So these are some of my favorite resources. I have every one of these books. <laughs> um, and whenever I'm birding or out, I usually grab at least three. So there's also an eBird online and an app, which I do have Audubon has an app and is a wonderful resource. The Merlin ID online and app is also incredible. And then a friend of mine mentioned the Raptor ID app, which is a new thing for me that I just downloaded a few months ago. Still getting used to it, but it's an awesome resource. As far as general bird ID and learning about raptors, their behavior, where they live, their habitat, their diet, allaboutbirds.org is a wonderful start. Um, but if you do have your smartphone, any field guide will work. I would say get outside, practice. Um, it takes a while to get used to where to look, what to look for, but what Julie mentioned in the first part of the presentation as far as silhouette shape, uh, field markings, I think everyone will be well on their way. And uh, I'm going to peek into the question and answer box just to make sure we've answered everything. Looks good. Um, very quickly, Sonia, thank you for answering all of the questions. <laughs> Our moderator, Sonia, she's amazing. Thank you so much. And before we let everybody go, um, we do have a survey at the very end of the presentation. Please take it, it's two minutes max. It helps us improve our future programs by getting all of your wonderful feedback. Please be honest, we're always looking to improve all of our programming. We have some incredibly passionate, knowledgeable staff and interns and volunteers who lead these programs. So any feedback you have will absolutely help. And also this tonight is part of a series. So please join us for more programs like this. Next Wednesday will be owl specific ID. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much for participating. Um, I love doing programs like this. I know Julie does too, and I know Sonia does. So before we let you go, very quick reminder, if you are going to go outside and embrace the outdoors, we want you to practice responsible recreation. So be safe, be careful, be smart, enjoy nature, learn some bird ID. Now you're pros at identifying raptors. So thank you so much for attending tonight's education program. Uh, Julie, I see you're back. Thank you so much.
Thank you. That was awesome. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. Have a good evening, everybody.